this talk is idiomatic Spock. Um, this is not really a Spock 101 talk, so this, I'm kind of assuming you know the basics of how to write tests in Spock. Uh, this is more about how to get the best out of it, how to write nice, maintainable specs that are going to be useful for years in the future. Um, there's a, there is a uh, GitHub link there. Some of the examples are on are actually executable code on there. Some of them are just in the slides. Um, and I'll make sure the updated version of the slides is on that repo um, sometime later this evening. Um, I guess kind of the key point that I want to get across in this talk is always that there's a big difference between being able to write tests and being able to write tests that are useful and concise and clear and actually useful. And um, one of the key things is that tests are documentation. They're executable documentation. They are executable documentation that can't go stale the way a document can. Um, or as my old colleague Gus Power always likes to say, like the team wiki where information goes to die. Um, so that means some of the most important things when writing tests are clarity and expressiveness and naming things well. Um, and I'm an English lit grad originally, so maybe I care about those kind of things a lot more than many engineers do, but um, it's kind of a, it, it's definitely a key thing when writing tests that you want to be useful over the long over the long term because there's nothing worse than a test you wrote six months ago, and I'm as guilty of this as anyone. But a test you wrote six months ago fails suddenly because of a regression, and you look at, look at that test and you're like, what what is this proving? I don't know. I don't. <laughs> I can see it does something. I don't really understand why. Or um, so. Here's a here's a kind of good quote that I think is is written generally about code, but is doubly true of tests. That there's something that that should be there for people to read. Um, or a more slightly less formal way of putting it is, code is if the guy who's maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. You don't want to get this guy angry at you. Um, when we talk about test-driven development, a lot of people have probably seen this diagram before. Um, the red-green refactor cycle. And the idea is you go around this loop repeatedly. You write a small test that fails. You write just enough code to make the test pass. Then you refactor while maintaining that test pass, passing until you've got uh, the sort of neatest, neatest implementation of that simple example. Um, this, this misses something though, because one of the key, like I said a minute ago, when your test catches a regression six months from now, you want to understand what's going on. So the thing missing here is what the test output should tell you, the diagnostics. And I realized that since I moved to the US uh, just under a year ago that this diagram, this additional step makes no sense because your traffic lights here don't go amber in between red and green, only the other direction, like the ones in Europe do. Um, but the idea is here, there's kind of an extra step of write a failing test and then make sure that what that test output is telling you is the information you need to know in order to fix it. Not just, ah, it's broken. Assert false, you know. Um, that's, that's not gonna be helpful six months down the line when you're trying to figure out what's broken this and why. Um, I first came across this idea in a book called Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tests by Steve Freeman and Nat Price, which if you're interested in the practice of test-driven development is probably the best book I've ever read on it. Um, so the key thing is you, you want to know the test fails for the right reason. It's detecting the right problem and explaining what the, what the problem is to you. And this leads to a really key thing, a really key prime directive, which is Never trust a test you haven't seen fail, ever. If you've never seen it fail, it, you can't assume it even works. It may not correctly detect a regression. It might fail for a different reason. It might not fail at all, even if the code is wrong. It might be, even if it does fail for the right reason, it might be hard to figure out why it's failed. So this, this is kind of a key, I, I guess, uh, test-driven development thing, but even if you're not writing your tests first, break the code so that you see the test fail and you can see that it's failing for the right reason and it's giving you useful information. Getting into some of the more specific things to do with Spock, I've, I've said that tests are there for people to read, that's other people on your team, yourself six months down the line. So Spock 
provides a bunch of annotations that can help with this. Um, none of these have any effect at runtime at all. Nothing. I hope, can you see that? Do you want me to turn the lights off? Is it a little bit difficult to see? Is that okay? Really? Uh, okay, sorry about that. Um, so anyway, the, the, you've got subject, which the idea is you put that on the object that you're testing. Um, you can also use it at the class level to say this is the class that this test refers to. You've got issue, which is a link to your issue tracker, and so on. These are all documentational. Um, they don't have any runtime effect, but they are accessible from bytecode. So if you want to write kind of tooling around this, Spock extensions that extract documentation from the specs, that kind of thing, that's, that's super easy to do because all of this information is retained in the, in the bytecode. Um, I also find the subject one particularly I really like using because for me it just helps me clarify my thinking about a test. I know this is when I'm doing when blocks, taking actions, this is probably the thing I should be taking actions on. Um, I don't know. And if, if you, you get to that situation where you have two things you want to call the subject, then you know you should probably be splitting this up into two separate test classes. So those are the documentation annotations. Um, unrolling is really important. So I guess it, I presume everyone knows about the Spox aware block and the fact that when you've got multiple, it'll execute the same test method multiple times, you can actually get it to produce a separate report line for each execution. And you, you do this with the unroll annotation. And there are actually multiple ways of doing this. I gave this talk at Netflix sometime last year and Peter Niedervisa who wrote Spock was there. And he later said that this section of the talk um, managed to like gloss over one of his, mis or find a good reason for the existence of a mistake he made in developing Spock. So I was, I was quite pleased about that because he, um, there are th what, what I'm gonna explain here is there are different ways of using unroll. Um, and they're appro I think they're appropriate in different situations because you've got to consider two people when you're, or two things when you're unrolling. You've got to consider the person who's coming along and reading your code and therefore he wants the title of that test method to be comprehensible but you're also thinking about the person who is looking at the test reports when something fails and they want the individual line items in that test report to, to indicate which particular variable is going wrong or which particular input is causing a problem. So they're two diff th those are two different things. So the simplest way of using unroll, which, which, is, which is kind of the more recent version, is this one where you put just the bare annotation on your test method and then you can use hash keys, tokens in your in the method name itself. And this is great for simple for simple uh, tests. What tends to happen though is if you're using more than one kind of rule of thumb ish, but if you're using you know too many of these hash expressions inside of the, the test method, it becomes really difficult to figure out the general case of what that test is describing. Um, so then you can split out into the unroll annotation, you can use the format that will be used to generate the report, which has all the hash expressions in it. And then you can describe the, use the method name itself to describe the general case that your, that your test is talking about. Um, neither of those things is right, neither of those things is wrong. It depends on a case by case basis, just it's something to bear in mind when you're writing tests. So in this case, you know, the, what goes in the unroll expression will define the very specific output for an individual case and the test me method name itself is describing the general idea of what, of what you're testing. You can also just put the unrolled annotation at the class level and then every single method gets unrolled. And then you can still use the hash expressions in the method title. So whichever one of these is right in a given situation is the, is the one to use, but just think about it is what I'm trying to, trying to say. Um, talking about unrolling, we can look at the idea of unrolled descriptions. So this is having variables in your where block, which are only used in the unroll expression, they're not used in the body of the test. So, an example of that: let's say we've got a we've got some kind of extension method on string that tells us whether actually I think Groovy has this extension method that tells us whether a string is an integer, and we give it a bunch of different strings and we say true or false whether it's, whether this should what this should method should return. Great. Except that, when we look at our test report, it kind of looks a bit clunky. Can tell if the string ABC is an integer or not. 
doesn't tell us whether it's true or false. We could use a hash expression and put the raw Boolean in there, but it's not going to look great. So what we can do is use a, a declaration. Notes that that's an equal sign there inside the where table, inside the where block. And um, declarations like that can can reference things from the data table. So there we're just using using that to turn that boot raw Boolean value into something more useful. So then we're now and I've even, there I've even extracted it into the unroll expression. So then when we see our test output, our report output, it's much better. Another thing we can use where blocks for is to use them for separating test data from test logic. And this is, this is an example of using a, a where block for something other than iteration. You can use it with iteration, but I'll sometimes use frequently use where blocks this way, even if the test is not going to be run twice, more than once. So an example of that here, we've got, uh, we're testing some kind of streaming library and we're asserting some callback gets called that's a mock. Great. But we've mixed up all of these kind of metasyntactic variables in a couple of different places. We've got some repetition there and the kind of dummy data is mixed in with the logic. I don't, I don't like that. I like what happens in the body of the test to be very, a very general description of what's going on and any, I'd like to separate out these kind of dummy values that are what, what's driving it. So what we can do there is, again, use an equal sign. That's not a pipe, so it's not going to repeat. Um, and then we can just refer to that value through the test. So then this, this reads really nicely as a general description and here's the nicely separated out dummy data. Another thing to think about when using where blocks. Um, so let's get into some kind of stylistic niceties of writing stock tests. Um, the first most obvious one is kind of, if anyone's ever read Clean Code by Uncle Bob Martin, he talks a lot about breaking down long methods into smaller methods, extracting helpers, extracting you know, higher level functions. Um, and this applies to tests as well, I think. It's not uncommon to see long tests like this. So here we've got, I don't know, it's a kind of Amazon-like checkout process. Somebody goes and logs in, he has to type his username and password. He goes to a product page, finds the thing he wants, puts it in his basket, presses checkout, asserts that he ends up there, then fills in a huge load of payment details, which is all dummy data again, and then submits a form and finally gets a message and his credit card gets charged. You know, this is kind of how I feel when I see, see tests like that. Um, similar to the page, if everyone's done Jeb or any functional testing in general, there's this idea of the page object model and this, it, that, that's a kind of specific application of what I'm talking about here and extracting things out into helper objects and helper functions. So again, the orange and black is not working great in here. Um, so here, here I've extracted a simple map modeling some data, another one modeling some other data, and some helper functions that, that are kind of, okay, given this user is logged in and he's added something to the basket, when he completes his checkout form, then he gets this message. And it, you know, you can see that immediately reads a whole lot better. That's a description of the behavior we're testing. It's not, it, it, it's abstracted from the detail of how that's done. And you know, the nice thing then, of course, is we can reuse these things between different tests. We can reuse these helper methods when we inevitably want 50 different tests that all have to log in. Um, one thing to avoid when doing this is never bundle up the Boolean of the assertion that you're asserting about in the then block inside of a method. Have a method that returns a Boolean because otherwise you just throw away all the diagnostic information from the from Spock's power assert. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there are different ways we can implement these kind of helper methods. So the simplest and most obvious that I do quite a lot is to use just static imports, static methods, and then statically import them into the into the test class. This is this is fine if if none of these things need to share any state with each other. Just a static imports work, works really well for a simple DSL. Um, another option is delegation. So Groovy's at delegate um, annotation. 
if you add that to, s to some kind of object that's inside of your specification class, then you can call methods on it without specifying the target. If you've ever looked at Jeb, that's what Jeb does with the browser object and the page object. If you've ever looked at any of the functional tests in Rat Pack for it using its HTTP client, it does exactly the same thing. So it'll just say post some data and target of post is actually its HTTP client object, but it delegates to it, so you never see that. Um, category, you can use Groovy's category and apply a category to a, to a Spock specification and then mix it in. I think the mixing is now deprecated in more recent versions of Groovy. Um, so that's kind of an early, if you're using older versions of Spock, these days you can do it with a trait. So you can define a trait and, and implement that in your specification. The thing you can't do with traits yet, um, if I don't know if it'll ever be implemented, but it would be kind of cool if it was, is you can't have test actual test methods in there that you mix in to something so uh, as a way of sharing different tests. But I'll show you another way of doing that in a, in a short while, but you can definitely pull out helper functions here. Um, when you're writing tests, remember you, you're writing Groovy. You don't just write Groovy that looks like Java. Um, the power assert in, in Spock makes it really easy to get awesome diagnostic output from, from fairly complex expressions. Um, I seem to f always find this is really useful when I'm dealing with assert making assertions about lists and maps and, and other types of collections, which Groovy has got some great syntactic sugar for. Um, uh, and the, the collection methods any and every are often really super useful when you're writing tests that are making assertions about a, a, a list of objects. Um, let's look at an, an example. So here we've got some kind of Grails-like thing that finds spaceships by their allegiance we expect to get three back, and we expect all of them to have the same allegiance. Yeah, this is, there's a lot of repetition going on here. We've had to assert that we get three back, because what happens if we got four back? We wouldn't know if we just made these three assertions. Um, we would, you know, we would just miss the fact that we got more back than, than we expected. It's repetitive, this thing fails fast, so if the first one isn't right, it won't even run the assertions for the other two, so you'll miss that information. This is, you know, we can do better in Groovy. This is very Java-like. Um, so this is how you would use every to do that. You just say, okay, the, get the results in the same way, and then say every one of them has this, you know, the, the result of this closure is true for every member of that list. This is, this is an improvement. But when we look at the test output, again, think about the test output, always, and the diagnostics you're going to see in future. So what do we get here? We 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 just see the the kind of two string of those objects in that list, and that this every expression returned false. We don't really see what's going on with. Okay, so it was false. Why was it false? That's important. So we can use Gro Groovy's implicit collect. A good rule of thumb is like if you're doing some kind of path traversal, put as much of the path outside of the every or the any as you can, and then just have the end result variable inside. So this dot here is doing an implicit collect on the allegiance of every ship in that list. So then instead of making an assertion about a list of starships, you're making an assertion about a list of strings. And then look how good our test report looks. So we have, again, the two string values of all the starships, but then we also see exactly what all their different allegiances were, and then we can see why this is false. So that's a very useful way to, to break things down. So Groovy can do, do a lot of really good things for us syntactically in, in tests. Um, we can also group assertions by target, and this is really useful for cutting down the kind of Java-like rep repetitive um, labeling of the, of the target of method calls. So here we're doing the same kind of thing again and we're, we're getting one starship back and we're saying, right, its registry should be this, its allegiance should be this, its class should be this, blah, blah, blah. So we're having to say ship dot on everyone. In Spock, you can use a with method and a closure and all this does is make the delegate of the closure whatever is the argument here. So then the, all of these properties are referenced on that object and it just groups it up nicely. If you've got a bunch of different things being asserted here, this really <coughs> tidies things up quite a lot. 
And we can even go further here and put the expression that generated the result inside of that with argument and just use an expect block. So that's even, even terser. Yes. So the question is, is, is with some object different from some object or with? And yes, this is my next point. Good spot. Um, it is different to Groovy's default with method because this is a Spock method which will apply an assertion to any Boolean expression inside of it, which Groovy's with method would not do. So don't make that mistake. I've done that a few times and then realized that my test isn't actually asserting anything. Um, here's an example with Groovy's with method being used in the when block to, to do a couple of operations on, on our Starship object and then Spock's with method being used to make assertions about what happens. So there you can see the difference. That's Groovy's version. These are not asserted. Even if they were in the then block, they wouldn't be asserted. This is Spock's version, which the things inside of here are. So this, yeah, this is also an interesting, interesting example because we're dealing with mocks here. So we're saying one times this report method got called with this argument and the target of that report method is this mock here that we're using in the with block. So you can use it for those kind of assertions as well as regular Boolean expressions. Speaking of assertions, the single responsibility principle is like the first thing in the solid principles, if you're familiar with those. Um, and my interpretation of how that applies to tests is kind of to have one logical assertion. And this doesn't mean that you should only ever have one assertion statement in, in a test, in an individual test. What it means is you should be testing one particular piece of behavior. Now, in order to test, in order to test that particular piece of behavior, it may be sensible to have 10 different assertion methods. Pro it's probably not, but you know, two or three is not out, out of bounds by any means. Um, but, the, but the key thing is to separate, separate assertions that are talking about completely orthogonal things about the, about the object. So here, what have we got? We have, we're finding some results again. And we're saying every one of them should have this allegiance. Oh, and that list should be immutable. Those are two different tests. That's really lazy. Even though this bit would be re repeated between the two tests, separate them anyway. Because when the behavior changes later, when your client comes to you six months down the line and says, oh, that doesn't need to be an immutable list anymore, then you can find the test for the relevant bit of behavior that needs to change and change it without stepping on some other bit of unrelated behavior. Um, it's easier to identify where things are. It's easier to identify the tests that are relevant to them when something breaks. It's easier to figure out where things are. So separate those out. Um, going back to my English lit background, grammar of blocks. When or then or given, or given and expect. So here's an example. We're adding, we're adding three guys into the ship's crew and then we're saying, Okay, so we still need a science officer. That's our assertion. And, it, and we've got, so when we add these three people in, then this should be the case. Is that really grammatically correct? I don't think it is. This isn't the action we're testing. This is a precondition. The action we're testing is that we are correctly identifying the positions that are open on our starship. Given and expect is the right thing to do in that situation. It's the same code. It works the same way. It's but for documentation value, it reads much better. Much better, it reads better. So think about that when you're writing a test. Sometimes it's right to use one and sometimes it's right to use the other. It depends what your test is doing. When you're dealing with mocks or throwing exceptions, you always have to use a when and a then. You have to separate them out. You can't use mock assertions or the thrown, Spock's thrown method in a, in a when, in an expect, expect block. Um, but here again, we're separating out the given and when. Because the action that we're testing is that when you add a second captain, it throws an exception. So, you know, a lot of people might write this with the two, those two things bundled together into a when block. Um, that's wrong. This is a precondition. The precondition is when you've already got a captain, when you try, then when you try and add another one, something goes wrong. That's, that's what block, block grammar means. <clears throat> and Spock's really nice about that because these things just get jumbled together in JUnit, right? It's just all one big long method and there's no separation 
I've actually seen people who still write JUnit start to adopt the Spock labels because they work in there. They don't do anything, but just for documentation value. I, I know one guy who works at um, Shazam who does that, adds in Spock's labels in, even when he's writing JUnit tests in Java. <coughs> um, so using mocks and stubs correctly is another kind of grammatical thing in, in tests. Um, here we're mocking our credit card service, then we're saying when some guys, somebody's logged in and buys a product and completes the checkout, then their, their credit card gets charged, great. That's the correct use of a mock because the thing we care about here is that his, his or her credit card gets charged. That's the behavior we're verifying and we want it to happen one time and only one time and we want it to happen for the right product and price, of course. <coughs> Here's another example. We've got a list of ships that's going to come back from a mock of some kind of database DAO object. So when we render these things as HTML or however we do that, then we should call this mock ship store one time and it will return that list. And then we get this HTML output. We don't care if this happens or not. That's not an appropriate use for a mock. This is the kind of precondition that drives any of this to work. We don't, we don't care if this happens. So theref therefore, we should use a stub in that situation. Don't just over-assert that something has to happen when that's not the point of the test. Instead, use a stub, and it even reads better. So then when we set up the stub, we can define that behavior of its list method at that point. Uh, one of the things I really like about Spock over over and above the, the typical uh, JUnit way of using mocks is that the assertion of what happens to the mock comes at the end. So it's like when this happens, then this is the result. Stubs work the opposite way around. It's, it, it's given that this will do, will behave in this way, then when this happens, then this is the result. So st that, that's, if you think about the way it reads, it become, often becomes clear whether to use a stub or a mock just from doing that. And so Spock's really helpful in getting you to order things correctly and structure things correctly. So use a, use a stub when you need it to happen, but you don't really care whether it does or not. And use a mock when the whole point of your test is that this particular interaction occurs. I, I sometimes think that you can, you can often detect this and don't take this as you should never do this because sometimes there are valid reasons to, but if you're, if you're asserting that something happens a certain number of times and returning something, that's kind of a hint that maybe this should really be a stub. It's not always the case. There are valid reasons for doing that sometimes, but it's, it's kind, of a, kind of a minor code smell that can hint to you that maybe you should be using a stub rather than a mock in that case. Enforcing preconditions. Um, so I talked about using given and expect earlier, or the expect block in particular. And I always thought that that purely existed just to do kind of short form tests. And then Luke Daly explained to me, actually the reason this was added to, to Spock's grammar was for enforcing preconditions. So here, here we have a test where we're creating a user and we try and persist him into the database. And then we find, if we do a SQL expression on how many users we have in the database, there's one. Okay. Well, what if there already were some? You know, what if that database was non-empty before we started? Or, you know, I've used this, this kind of thing when dealing with caches and things like that. So you, you, it's sometimes a bit, you're not quite sure where it's going to be before the test starts. So you can insert an expect block between the given and the when and make an assertion that the precondition holds true that, you know, the, the world before you take your action, your testing, is in really in the state that you think it is. So here we're saying, okay, so we create this guy. Oh, and by the way, there shouldn't be anything in the database at this point, so that then when we persist, persist this, this user object, now there is one thing. So you can combine the use of expect with when and then. It's not something I use terribly often, but every now and again, it's, it's extremely useful. Um, here's a real example I wrote some time ago where we're launching some kind of batch execution job. We have a stub that's gonna successfully simulate success on three 
three steps in our job. When we launch it, we expect that actually it completes because, and then we can assert that if we try and restart it, it doesn't let us. Because actually, if we tried to restart it and for, restart it, and for some reason it hadn't finished, it would let us, and this exception wouldn't be thrown, and we wouldn't know why. We'd sit there trying to debug through this, figuring out, oh, why is it letting me restart this job? Oh, it's because the thing never actually finished, because we'd set something up wrong. So there's a real example of using um, expect in that way. An even better way to do, with, to do this kind of precondition is to, to use um, Spock's old method, which is my favorite thing for freaking out Java developers when they look at, look at Spock. So here we've got a simple stack, and we push something onto it, and we assert that the size is now one. Okay. Well, what if it wasn't empty beforehand? In, in JUnit, you would do something very similar to this, where you'd kind of store a variable of the old size, and then you would say, well, the size is now the old size plus one. And Spock gives you a shorthand way of doing this, which is fantastic if somebody hasn't ever used Groovy before and just looks at this and tries to figure out how it works. So we say this, we assert that the stack size is now the old stack size plus one. And the trick is kind of given away if you ever run through this with a debugger, because it goes and it executes this first, and then jumps back up here, because Spock is rewriting the it's rewriting the syntax tree of the bytecode. So it goes and evaluates this first, stores it away in some variable somewhere, then runs your when block, and then runs the then block and compares that cached value. But it looks good. It reads really nicely. It's very clear what's going on. You haven't got this variable hanging around that doesn't really mean anything through the course of the test. It's just a very economic way of expressing expressing that kind of assertion. You can use this in any context. I've used this in Jeb to do, you know, I go to my Grails application and I create a new object, and then when I go back to the list page, there's one more row, and you can do that with the old expression. It can be anything. It doesn't have to be a simple variable. We can now get into the evil Spock. You can tell he's evil from the beard. Um, the Spock anti-patterns. Um, so one of the biggest anti-patterns is organizing tests really badly. Uh, and I think this kind of comes from that convention where you generate, a, you generate a test for a class, and a lot of people seem to think, okay, so now forever and ever, there has to be this one test class that corresponds to this one production class. No. Split them up according to beha by behavior. This is probably going to be unreadable, but it doesn't matter. So we've got some common setup being done here. Then we've got two different test methods that actually use the data that was set up here, and one test method that doesn't. That's a huge code smell there. If you've got, if you've got tests that are ignoring something that went on in, in setup, or even worse, I've, I've seen and even done in the past, something in one of the test methods that is undoing some of this, then just split them up into two separate tests. You don't have to have one test class corresponding to one production class. And when you want to refactor your production code, you often want to split those classes up anyway. So then does that mean you have to split the tests up? Who, you know, it's, they don't have to correspond. When block bloat is when you have everything happens from the beginning of the universe until the, the point that you want to make an assertion in the when block. So. I'm going to start rushing here because we haven't got I haven't got a lot of time left. I think, but um, you know, think about where's the boundary of the precondition. What's the precondition here? Some somebody is going to the product page and adding some things to a to a basket, and then when they go to the basket page, they should see all of those items. The action we're testing is going to the basket page and seeing the right things, not all of this precondition that gets us there. So that belongs up in given. Fairly fairly straightforward. Um, this is an easy trap to fall into, the ugly mirror, which is when you, you kind of work out your expected value for your assertion in the same way that the production code is working out the result. So you prove that A equals A, and of course that's true. Um, so here, for example, we're kind of inserts, using some kind of service to insert some data into a database, and then we're using the SQL expression to list the data out that's probably, and compare it to the result of our of our sort of find by Grails service style find by method. 
Well, you know, you can bet that, that what this method is doing inside is exactly that query. So what does this prove? Nothing. Exactly, yeah. Your failure first would hopefully catch that. Um, but e even then, it's kind of an easy trap to fall into, especially when you're dealing with large where blocks that are, that are, that are kind of describing very general conditions. So make sure you, make sure you avoid that. This next anti-pattern kind of needs a better name, and it's a little bit of a hard one to describe, um, especially when you can't see the code properly because of the lights in this room. But this is where you kind of make assertions based on, so here we, we set up a whole bunch of complex data. We've got starships with years they went into service, and then we find, we do some grail style finder of find by allegiance newest first, all the Federation starships, so they should be ordered in by this year that they went into service. And then we just check that the names look right. Well, we're missing something there because they're not actually in the right order. This test might pass, that doesn't mean this method's doing the right thing because we're, assert we're not asserting about the data we care about, we're asserting about some kind of indicator, some kind of pseudo-logical label for the data we care about. Um, a better way to do it is use some kind of real expression. So here we can go, okay, l all of them are the right, for the right allegiance and if I enforce an ordering on, their, on those years, those year properties, it comes out in the same order. That's a much better expression because that's what we care about. We don't care about these names of the, of the spaceships and they could be guiding us down the wrong path into thinking this is working when actually it isn't. Right, yeah, yeah, so what it's hiding there is that actually it's coming back in the wrong order because you're just assuming that you've got those names in the right order and it, but it's not obvious, it doesn't really tell you that. Right, yeah, this one is the wrong, yeah, this one's even the wrong allegiance because you haven't asserted that. You're just going by these labels, these names for, for your expectations and that's not, it's not telling you the right information and it can be hiding, it can be hiding the important failures underneath. It's kind of a subtle one that, but it's, it's a really easy trap to fall into, especially with end-to-end um, -end tests, with web interfaces where you very typically kind of set something up and then make some kind of assertion about something that appears on another screen and doesn't necessarily tell you if what happened is really what you, th you thought happened because that other screen might be wrong. It's a danger with the higher, the higher up the stack you're testing, the more this is a danger. Um, I don't have a good, an example for this one, but you know, don't inappropriately peek into the internal state of objects to verify things. Use their own behavior to make assertions about them. This there's kind of also an argument about don't overuse mocks here as well. I like mocks, but I like them used appropriately. If you've got more than more than one mock in a test method, I often think that's a bit of an indication things are too complicated. Not always. Nothing's hard and fast. But and don't treat the fact that Groovy will ignore will cheerfully ignore the private keyword as an invitation to go looking inside of objects. It's not the right thing to do. Because then it it, it prevents you from refactoring that object, right? Because then you've t coupled your You've coupled your test to how it works internally. You should always be thinking about the what that thing does, not how it does it. Uh, fail fast assertions are, you know, everyone knows not to do this, right? You don't test stuff in a loop. This one won't even work because it won't, it won't apply an assertion to something going on inside of a closure. Um, Yeah, this is kind of another run-on run on pattern where you do multiple multiple whens and thens. You can do it, but uh, this kind of feels like it should be split up into multiple tests. Stepwise as well, I don't like. Sometimes it's unavoidable or for performance reasons, but what stepwise does is run this test and then this test and then this test and then this test, and they always have to run in that order, and their data bleeds, the data bleeds between them, that nothing gets cleaned up in between, and if the first one fails, none of the others get run. So you, you can get into this situation where, ah, oh, this one's failed, I'll make that pass, oh no, this one's failing, and it just slows you down enormously. Tests should be item potent as much as possible. Uh, so that's some anti-patterns, let's look at some of the kind of thinking outside the box, more advanced stuff you can do with Spock. 
TCK specification, so that's tool compatibility kit, where you've got multiple implementations of some interface, you can provide multiple specs for it that all run the same test. So here we're putting a generic signature on our specification and we've defined an abstract method or we've got a subject that hasn't been assigned um, and we're, we want this test to pass for any implementation of this. This would be good if you're providing an alternate implementation of a collection or you know anything. And then if we've got an in, you know, here we've got some kind of in-memory version of a persistent object and we just extend that spec and all we have to do is create the, create the object under test and then for our real persistent implementation we kind of do some extra setup because we are wiring up an H2 database behind the scenes and we still just create, create our object under test and then when, but we don't have to re-implement the test method, that's in the superclass. When we run it, all of it, when we run the tests, all of those things run for both different implementations and you, so you can verify that things consistently adhere to, a, to, a, to an interface. Um, Data-driven par parameterization is nice. You can drive a where block with, with this double arrow syntax with anything iterable. So here we can, we can make an assertion that a table has to have primary keys. This is a real test I wrote a few, many years ago now where we suddenly hit a performance problem and realized we'd forgotten to put a load of primary keys in a bunch of tables. So we put this test in our system to ensure that we always did. And the nice thing about it is it reads that list of table names out of the database metadata. So when we add a new table to the, te to the system, we don't have to modify the test, it still checks it. It opens a connection in the setup spec and reads all the table names out of the database. So, you know, this, dry, you can drive a where block with a, with a CSV file or with a database connection or with anything that you can iterate over. It doesn't have to be literal stuff in the, in the, um, in this test itself. And this leads us on to something called property-based testing, which is where, this is originally came from Haskell with a library called QuickCheck. Um, this is where you generate large numbers of inputs to test that some condition applies to all of them. Um, there's a really nice library for, for doing this called Spock Genesis that I just discovered a little while ago. Um, and it's a Spock-specific version of it. It works really, really nicely. So if anyone came to my workshop the other day, I did the FizzBuzz cata. So we can say, right, I expect fizzbuzz of some value to equal fizz when that value is any number that's a multiple of three but not a multiple of five. And you can just generate 2,000 of those things or as many as you like. And it will iterate over that test. It will unroll that test for all of them. So you can generate enormous amounts of data and just check that this condition always holds true. And here I'm you know, generating some integers, filtering by some type of in particular type of integer I want and then saying give, yeah give me 2,000 of those and you get a lo lovely test output like this. You can also like any other iterable thing you can refer you can use the equals operation the equals operator in a where block to refer to the current value of that on a given iteration so you can do clever things with that. It just work, it's an iterable. This thing implements iterable, so it works just like a list would. Um, one of the o object partners guys a couple of years ago wrote a really good blog post about testing JavaScript with Narshawn. Na and you can pass, it turns out you can pass, let's say we're, you know, we're parsing our moment.js file and we want to pass groovy objects into it. We can do that. We can pass Spock mocks into JavaScript and test them. We can, yeah, we can do all sorts of things. So that's kind of an interesting, interesting possibility. It's, it's really useful if you're doing kind of server-side rendering of handlebars templates. There's some, somewhere I've used this where you kind of want to use the same code that you would use on the front end for some utility functions in JavaScript and you want those to be applied when you render your screens on the server side as well. It's a good little trick. Um, some more cool features of Spock that are slightly less used. Um, when you're unrolling, you can logically separate inputs and outputs using a double pipe. It used to be that if you did this, IntelliJ would re reduce to format the table correctly, and now it does. They fixed that at last, so it's just a little bit of syntactic sugar. It doesn't do anything other than for your eyes purposes. Um, you can, if you want to, actually declare param 
declare parameters on your test methods. This isn't often useful, but here where you're kind of losing the type information of what these things in the where block are, and you want type inference to work in your IDE, you can just put the, you can put the parameters up there. That's all that Spock is really doing under the hood anyway with a where block. Just generally, you don't have to declare it. Spock does it for you when it rewrites the AST. Um, conditional tests are nice. You can ignore if certain things. This has come up a few times where there's some weird condition that happens in certain versions of Java. So we run the test suite against multiple versions, but this particular test we know fails in a certain version. You can use it for doing something like J units categories, skipping certain classes, classes of tests based on an environment variable. These Java version env and properties are in scope automatically in these annotation closures, these closures in these annotations. Um, so, you know, something that doesn't work on Windows, we can skip the test, or only works on Windows, or is testing a Windows specific condition, for example. You can do that kind of thing. Um, this is a real one I wrote, or something like a real one I wrote, where it's, it, it's only valid when I'm running it inside of my work um, network. If I try and run it at home, I know this thing's going to fail because it can't contact a certain server. So I can say, ignore, ignore this test if I can't hit this URL. And all it's doing is open a, opening a URL connection, waiting, to, waiting a second to see if it can get anything from it other than an error. There's, <laughs> if you have this on a lot of tests, though, if this unrolls, um, it will keep calling this method. So add Groovy's memoize to it so it only gets called once and it caches the result. Otherwise, your test suite will take hours to run. Um, I only spotted this yesterday, test scoped extension methods. If you have a groovy category, so here we've got some kind of extra method we've added onto string. Spock has a use annotation, which applies that category throughout the test. You can also put it at the class level. So that's kind of, uh, that's another way you could probably mix in some helper functions, it, almost like a mix in. A Groovy's old mixing annotation, which is deprecated now. Um, and it's, I, th I think it's nicer than Groovy's use block syntax. So this just applies it consistently wherever uh, on the scope of that annotation. You can use JUnit rules in Spock. Um, yes, temporary folder is a JUnit rule that creates a temporary folder. That's in the JUnit library. It's a standard thing. Um, and it kind of has its own setup and teardown semantics that are automatically applied, and that just works seamlessly in, in, in Spock. So there are a bunch of rules that exist out there. If any of them are useful, use them. You can use hamcrest matches. Um, this is a good one where it's returning a set and not a list. And so you, if you try and assert that the sh things you get back are a particular set of particular bunch of values using a groovy literal list, they might not be in the same order, so your test will fail but it doesn't matter. So, you know, I, instead you can use this expect method with a hamcrest matcher. If it's a really complex assertion statement, this, I think this reads a bit better. It's, it's an option, not something I use very often, but it's an option. Um, yeah, and there's a different version of it. Instead of the expect method, you can have an expect method in then that takes some kind of object and a hamcrest matcher to apply to it. If you're using expect, you can say expect that this value matches this hamcrest ham matcher. Cleaning up behind yourself, you know about um, setup and teardown. So here we're opening some kind of JD, uh, H2 database. At the end, we always want to drop the table and close our database connection. We can do that automatically with an auto cleanup annotation on our connection. And it will, by default, that looks for a close method. If the method you need to call happens to be called something else, you can specify that, and it will still work. Um, and it runs in reverse declaration order. So this one will get cleaned up. This one will get set up first, then this one, then this. But this one gets cleaned up first, so it kind of unrolls back up, which helps you in this situation. If you tried to do them in the wrong order, it'd probably fail because you can't drop the table if it's already disconnected from the database. And you can do that on shared fields. If you have a shared field with an auto cleanup on it, the cleanup happens at the end of the entire test class, not the test method. So as equivalent to cleanup spec. There's another couple of things that are 
useful if you monkey with system properties or the meta class anywhere in your test. Put these annotations on and Spock will automatically put the entire set of system properties and any meta classes that you specify the relevant class for in the annotation back how they were afterwards. So you don't have to, you don't have to worry about that stuff bleeding in between tests, which is deadly in Grails things where you kind of, um, you may implement like a tag lib or something in using the meta class and then you forget to clean it up properly and 20 test cases later it's still in scope and for some reason something else fails, but it doesn't fail when you run it on its own. That's, so th that's super useful to confine, confine meta class changes. Um, and I think I'm done. 114 slides. Any questions? Uh, I think you can use a shared one or a static. That's a good question, actually. Off the top of my head, I can't remember. You, um, you can definitely use static ones. I, actually, thinking about it, that's probably the only thing you could. Um, good question. I think it would have to be static. I, I'm guessing to try it. I'll be interested to know the answer. But I, I, I can't really see how it would be able to see it if it wasn't static. Anyone else? Thanks for coming. Hope you found that useful.